Welcome to our online seminar. I uh, want to announce that the next three talks, you can see Scott Aronson, Sean Cooey, and Elizabeth Croissant. They should all be interesting. And today we have uh, Alina Vodiva, who's talking to us from Newcastle. Alina is uh, well known in, for her work on Bovell surfaces and on a geometric group theory and an expert on buildings, which she's going to tell us about, and their relation to C star algebras, newer high dimensional analogs of the Thompson groups. So we're looking forward very much to your talk. And now I'll unshare my screen and give it over to Alina. Yes, so can I? So now I, I share my screen, right? And yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, great. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation. I really enjoy the Harvard Picture Language Seminar. So this is my outline. I'm going to talk about high dimensional analogs of Thomson groups. But I, actually, I'm going to touch several subjects. And actually, it's quite interesting. Um, so this uh, Thomson group and their relation to theoretical physics. But what am I interested in? I'm interested in kind of how to get all the theory to, to the higher dimensions. So the, the subject requires several fields, operator algebra, semi-group theory, dynamical systems, representation theory. And also, uh, from the point of view of geometric group theory, there are also two topics. And it's like still different communities, people working on buildings and pe people working on Thompson groups. And uh, um, also, there are many analogs in um, theoretical physics and mathematical physics. And what, what I would like, I would like to recommend uh, uh, kind of survey by Brossier on John's connections between subfactor, conformal field theory, uh, Thomson groups, and nodes, which kind of highlights several fields of mathematics and theoretical physics, how they relate, relate to each other. And I somehow have quite an ambitious goal uh, to move all of this to to the higher higher dimensions but of course even even in the case of like um, uh, thompson groups and nodes this is already quite involved and that's why like if you move to higher dimensions it becomes every every bit becomes more complicated so today <clears throat> what I would like to discuss, but of course it's very difficult to give all the formal definitions. I, I would like to just to give a flavor uh, of the subject and what I'm going to discuss it's um, um, what, what I, how I think about higher dimension, dimensional generalization of Thomson groups and their connections with um, sister algebras. So saying in the uh, in the framework of one Jones, it's the Thomson group in Pythagorean algebras. And I will kind of um, show what, what happens in higher dimensions. And saying why it's difficult to go to the higher dimension uh, in generalizing, saying, Thomson groups. Because uh, in higher dimensions, um, we have some kind of counterintuitive geometry, and in particular counterintuitive geometry of buildings. And also I will try to show some pictures to see, to show why, what, wh which phenomena appear in higher dimensions. And also I would like to mention another application of building. I recently developed it still kind of, I'm still writing it up. It's like Drinfeldman and solutions of Jan Baxter equations, but still by the end of the talk, I hope to show at least some, some examples how, how it uh, works. So this is 
So now let's discuss um, Thompson groups. And um, uh, actually Thompson groups can be realized in many ways. So they can be realized in terms of operations of on rotary, rooted binary trees. Uh, they can be realized as subgroups of the piecewise linear hom homomorphisms of the unit intervals. But also they can be realized in terms of so-called prefix codes, which are set of words with certain properties. And actually I will um, concentrate on this third approach because it seems to be the best way to uh, generalize to the higher dimensions. And also uh, the approach with high dimensional prefix code, uh, which, um, uh, which I have in mind, seems to be able to put under one roof all possible generalizations of uh, Thomson groups which do exist in the literature. It's like Brin Thomson groups and um, work of Colin Blake, Britta Nussingis, they are collaborators. And uh, what happens that um, it's such a rich subject that there are many, many interpretations and very difficult to come up with some invariants. So sometimes like you, you see that something does look like uh, like a Thompson group or its generalization, but then it's difficult to see if it's the same group or not because it's not that many invariants known. And um, uh, what I kind of suggest it's um, sister algebraic invariants. So uh, what what happens that um, the theory of Thompson groups and um, like high dimensional Thomson groups is closely related to sister algebras of certain kind. And also those sister algebras are so nice that their case theory distinguishes the algebras. And then as it turns out, it distinguishes the group as well. Uh, but it's quite involved subject. So I don't know how, how many details I will give, but at least um, I will give the flavor of the subject, so don't um, hesitate to ask me questions anytime uh, in the talk. Okay, so I will remind the definitions of the sister algebra. Of course, it's like um, most of people are theoretical physicists, and but uh, as I know that also in this seminar, the audience is very broad. So just, just in case, I will remind what are the sister algebras. So saying the, uh, the abstract uh, characterization of uh, sister algebras was given in like 43 by Gelfand and Neumark. And um, uh, the sister algebra, um, it's a Banach algebra of a field of complex numbers together with a star map with um, the following properties. So the star map is in evolution. And then also the, the star of a sum is the sum of, of the stars. And also the star of a product of X and Y, it's um, uh, X star, uh, Y star, X star. And um, also there are, like there is a norm. So, and um, for any complex number, uh, star of, um, Lambda X uh, is um, uh, the conjugate of Lambda multiplied by X star. Okay. And um, now, so I'm about to, so what I already mentioned that I'm going to talk about uh, prefix cause. And it's a bit um, technical. And of course, of course, my goal was today to give a formal definition of the Thompson group but in terms of prefix codes, and then to give a flavor of what happens in higher dimensions. And, but the way how I will approach the Thomson group itself, it's slightly different that for example, like um, you know, one John's approach and other people when they looked at either trees or like piecewise linear homomorphism of the unit interval, 
And uh, what this example shows that actually uh, the most common definition of the Thomson group by the piecewise linear homeomorphism of the unit interval doesn't extend well to higher dimensions. What does it mean that if you have an interval, just a unit interval, we divide it by half and then we can choose either left or right side and then we can again divide it by half. And so this kind of way of dividing the interval into half in, into kind of dyadic intervals is very easy and intuitive. But if, for example, we start dividing of cubes, it's not true that we can do this always in a way, kind of in an iterative way. So the smallest counterexample, it's a cube divided by five pieces. So I don't know if, if it's really easy to understand what it is. So actually it's five pieces. There is one cube facing me and there is another cube which is like in, in the opposite side. And then there are four blocks. There are three blocks which are um, kind of dividing the cube and it's saying, of course, it's a homework question uh, to see that um, this particular partition of a cube cannot be obtained by, by just uh, taking halves of cubes and then ch chase, uh, choosing left or right and saying vertical horizontal. So it simply doesn't work. So we do really need um, a different uh, different methods. So this is kind of counterintuitive geometry. And actually this uh, picture is quite useful uh, that when I was looking at various papers on um, higher dimensional analogs of Thomson groups, uh, even I have, of course, I will not give them references, but actually I have found uh, several mistakes uh, of quite um, in papers of uh, quite prominent people just by testing this example. So very often people think about like high dimension analogs of Thomson groups as saying blending several copies of one dimension of the classical Thomson group, but it's not always the case. So just, I was talking for so long to motivate you to listen for them uh, quite um, um, technical definitions of the prefix codes. So saying, let's have an alphabet where you in, so uh, A star, it's uh, all words in letters um, uh, of the alphabet A. So for A will be a final alphabet. And if saying um, the word V is presented as uh, UW for some W, we say that u is a prefix of v and um, what is the prefix code so this is the most um, um, important um, uh, definition maybe for this talk that uh, prefix code it's a subset of words of um, a star such that no element of p is a prefix of any other element of P. And also uh, P is a maximal prefix code over e A if it's not a proper subset of any other prefix code A. So I will say like maximal, but of course I very often I will be dropping the, the word maximal. Okay. And um, R is the right ideal of the set of words of A. Uh, then R is um, P R star for uniquely determined prefix called P. And P is the unique uh, minimal set of generators for R. And another definition that R is essential if the intersection um, with the identity for every right ideal i um, is um, is not empty. Yeah, and actually this is um, so. What what I give here it's um, 
uh, those statements, they, they would require a bit of work, but they're not too, too difficult. So actually, um, the ideal P A star is essential if and only if P is a ma maximal prefix code. Okay, so any questions about uh, this page of definitions? So I will have two pages of technical definitions because I also promised to Arthur to define a Thomson group um, kind of from, from scratch because we have a lot of young people who maybe didn't see Thomson's group before. So don't hesitate to ask if something is not clear. Okay. So you see at the end of this slide, we already have a formal definition of, of the Thompson group um, V. So let um, R1 and R2 be right ideals of um, A star and bijection phi between those right ideal is an A star isomorphism if phi of UV equals phi of UV for all u from r1 and any word from a star and also we have an i a star isomorphism phi restricts uh, to a bijection from p1 to r2 and also uh, another kind of uh, important definition, it's um, about extensions of the isomorphisms. And uh, so this is also another kind of non-trivial fact that isomorphism uh, between essential right ideals has a unique maximal extension. So this is all like formally, but how, how you can think about it actually what is the geometric interpretation of um, uh, maximal prefix codes you can just think about them as um, finite trees so and uh, the formal definition the thompson group is the group consisting of maximal uh, isomorphies between finitely generated essential right ideals with the following multiplication so phi xi is maximal of the composition of two kind of partial functions. Okay, but how, how you think about it when you, when you have a geometric interpretation, so you can think about pairs of um, finite trees. Okay, so a bit of, um, uh, so I, now I'm going to introduce buildings um, very soon. And this is kind of um, maybe unusual way to look at buildings and also maybe for, for the kind of um, audience of uh, mathematical uh, physicists, it's not um, so common to, to think about buildings and to uh, think about the complexes which, um, uh, I'm going to define, but how I want to motivate this, it's um, because it seems to be the right way to generalize like um, Thompson groups and um, uh, Pyth Pythagorean sister algebras. Because so actually in a lot of work on Thompson groups, we don't have very complicated geometry because this is kind of one dimensional situation doesn't doesn't require a kind of sophisticated geometric methods because when we think about trees we even don't need to think about like directions and when we also when we think about one dimensional words it's somehow intuitively clear where, where is the beginning of the word and where is the end and if saying the word is semi-infinite it's um it's all kind of intuitive intuitively clear what we mean. But when we go to higher dimensions, we will look like at higher dimensional words, and then we need to have more structure defined. So, yeah, so as I mentioned, my, my goal to 
discuss the higher dimensional generalizations of Thomson groups and also how to um, look at sister algebras and then how to use um, uh, them to distinguish the groups. Okay, so now I will talk about buildings. And again, I want to be completely rigorous in the way I, I give um, uh, most of the definitions, like um, saying, for example, the definition of buildings, but then I will talk, I will give like very, very explicit examples. So even if it's like not um, completely clear, uh, like the general structure of buildings, so it doesn't matter because I think that what is my goal for today is just to give a flavor of the subject and maybe then to initiate some like discussions because uh, it looks like that um, um, such structures as I'm going to introduce today, they may be useful in various uh, parts of uh, theoretical physics. So buildings consist of chambers and apartment. And we will talk about Euclidean and hyperbolic buildings in the same time. So it's a, and I'm saying, and I mentioned Euclidean building is an n-dimensional complex X such that X is a union of tessellated empty spaces, which are called apartments. And then for any two chambers, uh, there is an apartment containing both of them. And if two apartments have non-trivial intersection, then there is an isomorphism between those apartments fixing their intersection point-wise. And uh, what, what it means, it means that all apartments are the same tessellations. And also this kind of, uh, this, this is an isomorphism between the apartments. It's not the isomorphism of the building because the building is really quite a, a complicated structure. But I will start with like one dimension, with an example of a one dimensional building, which is not too bad. So it's like um, a Kelly graph think of a free group. And how we, think about the chambers and, apart and apartments. So actually a quiz, anybody knows what would be a chamber in this building? So a chamber here is just an edge. And an apartment, it's a, infinite pass from one point at infinity to, to the other. And then in the tree, you can see that, so if you come back to the definition of a building, so we have if n is equal to one, then apartment is um, just a union of, uh, of edges and it's a, it's a tessellation of um, just one line, right? And then of course, the second um, um, axiom is true as well, because um, it's clear that for any two timbers, so if you pick any two edges in, in the graph, uh, there is an apartment which contains both of them. And in this picture also, I'm going to explain an idea which I'm going to exploit later. So, how I will construct higher dimensional buildings. Because like for, for dimension one, it's not a problem, but how you think about higher dimensional buildings, they um, usually cannot be embedded in the three dimensional space. So we will construct them as universal covers of some finite complexes. So for example, here, the four, four valent tree can be presented as a universal cover of a wedge of two circles, right? So you have a finite object um, with one vertex and two edges and the universal cover, it's um, three. But we will look at more complicated um, uh, higher dimensional pictures and then I will refer to this uh, picture again. 
And also we can think about like, um, this is what I already mentioned about the prefix codes. We can think them about like as uh, finite subtrees partitioning the boundary of the infinite tree. So actually here there is another um, object to think about how we think about the boundary of, um, of the building or of a tree here. So if we fix saying one point, like here it's saying identity, then a point at infinity is just a semi-infinite word. And uh, so what is the geometric interpretation of prefix codes? It's if we have a sub, such a subtree that if we look at all uh, points on the boundary which correspond to each bit of this subtree, then um, they correspond to a sub partitioning the boundary of the infinite tree or a disjoint set. Okay, now let's slowly move to the higher dimensions, but here just an example of an apartment in the dimension two. So later on, I will mainly talk about um, Euclidean buildings, but the buildings can be hyperbolic as well. But even just one apartment can be seen as an example of a building because it's a, like tessellation of the hyperbolic plane and the polygons can be treated as uh, chambers. So for any two chambers, there is this unique apartment. But of course we are interested in much more complex apartments uh, building than just containing one apartment. And to, to go further, I need more uh, formal, formal definitions. So we will say that a polyhedron is a two-dimensional complex which, which is obtained from several decorated polygons with words on the boundary by identification of the sides uh, on their of the sides with the same label respecting orientation and so i will come up even with three-dimensional objects today but uh, as a formal definitions i give them dimension two and then i will just explain how to generalize it to the higher higher dimensions. So why this method of um, thinking about um, kind of uh, cut and paste techniques is good because uh, uh, these polyhedra cannot be embedded into the three-dimensional space anymore. So the way to analyze the properties of our objects is mainly like tracing uh, the words on the boundary of polygons. And another definition which I need is so-called link. Uh, and if you think about a sphere of a very small radius centered at the vertex of a polyhedron, uh, then the intersection of the sphere and your complex is a graph. So for the, uh, for, for the uh, tetrahedron, uh, a link at the vertex is just a graph with three vertices and three edges but we are going to be interested in much more involved links and also we are going to be interested in so-called thick polyhedra that each edge is contained in at least three polygons and of course that locally it's not a problem to draw this in the uh, three-dimensional space but imagine we consider um, infinite tessellations of um, saying Euclidean planes and then um, our building becomes really impossible to, to draw. So that's why we need links and um, uh, this is uh, this is the link of the polyhedra I showed before with seven triangles so if we get those seven triangles we glue the edges um, together respecting orientation, then we get just one vertex and we get this um, graph as a link. So any questions so far? Because I think it's maybe unusual 
kind of notions for for the theoretical physics audience and of course uh, i already like like arthur already knows all these definitions and uh, people from his group but we have a very large audience here so please don't 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 hesitate to ask questions okay so how do we get buildings so of course now we were working very hard we were looking at um, quite involved examples but now we already rewarded because we already have one example of a non-trivial two-dimensional building because if we take those seven triangles and we identify the sides with the same labels respecting orientation we get a two-dimensional complex but then if we take the universal cover we already have an example of a building so now i can refer to that um, elementary picture when we just had a, a wedge of two circles and uh, the infinite tree was um, the universal cover so in the same way we can use an old result of balman and brin and get a, a two-dimensional uh, building. So if you have a two-dimensional thick polyhedron and all the links are graphs of diameter m and girth to m, then the universal cover is a two-dimensional building. And um, this was, uh, so their result was quite abstract, but um, uh, it was um, not clear how to get such polyhedra. And this was kind of my, my contribution that I developed some like combinatorial and geometric uh, methods how to get uh, these polyhedra so like i started um, like nearly 20 20 years ago and then uh, since that i had like many series of infinite families in arbitrary dimensions and uh, surprisingly those objects appear in many many fields of um, mathematics like algebraic geometry and uh, uh, harmonic analysis and and so on and it turns out that this kind of very concrete realizations turned out to be quite useful and now i'm quite happy that it turned out that it's um it also appears in um, like saying um, sister algebras and uh, in young baxter equations okay so now let's talk about words so here like the next um couple of slides fit very well to the uh, topic of the seminar it's like picture picture language project and so far we were talking about the words so ev everybody kind of understand what you what is the word and um, the question is how do we generalize the notion of a word and how I will think about the words saying if you have saying euclidean building which is obtained from a complex from our polyhedron as a universal cover and the initial labeling of the um of the polyhedra uh, will be inherited by the building as well and we will take just the rectangular subsets of the apartments so okay here we are supposed like it's a rectangular region but uh, also we uh, we want to have some decoration by them uh, by the elements of um, of the group which acts on the building and uh, now what is the boundary of of the building and uh, in the one dimensional case i already mentioned that we were just looking at semi infinite words uh, and uh, their classes of equivalences but for if you have a all the two dimensional building or even higher dimensional building we think about the boundary as equivalence classes of sectors and um, now we can just 
give a flavor what is the construction of a higher dimensional Thompson group. So of course, no way that you can give precisely all the generalizations, all the precise definitions, which um, I gave like 10 minutes ago, but at least I can give you the flavor how we think about this higher dimensional Thompson group. So like ND dimensional prefix code is a subcomplex of a building which corresponds to a partition of the boundary into disjoint sets. And then it's like very similar to what we had in the one dimensional case, we define it as isomorphism classes of um, those prefix codes. And so, of course, it's quite difficult to give all, all those precise definitions, but I can at least show how do we think about those prefix codes and how do we get such complexes that they are universal covers are indeed buildings. So I think uh, I will start with um, uh, one example of um, a group which acts on a product of two trees. And actually the Cartesian product of two trees can be thought as a building as well. And uh, if you think about product of trees, uh, the apartment, they are planes tessellated by squares and chambers are just squares. So, but again, if you didn't see buildings before, maybe you've seen like calligraphs of the groups for sure. So how we can think about it, we can uh, think about it as a, saying there is a group with four generators, four relations, then you can look at the calligraph of this group. So this group is an infinite group, and um, you can just uh, fill in um, cycles of length four and get a building. So it will um, look at many squares. And um, so you will have four squares meeting at every edge. And then every two squares lie in a common apartment and so on. So what is the link at every vertex of this building is um, complete bipartite graph 4-4. Four, four. And I can show now some pictures, how to think about it. So first of all, what are the words, right? The examples of like two dimensional words, which correspond uh, to, to this building. So for example, the word of the size 2-3. So so you see that that's why it's kind of may, maybe uh, such object didn't appear before in like other fields saying in, in physics or um, because it's very difficult to come up with something like this accidentally. You need to have some, some idea behind this. But when you get the idea, I think it's then it's not that difficult to understand how it works. So, uh, so this, is, this is kind of, this is an example of a uh, two-dimensional word, two by two, but picture on the right, it's um, how locally our building looks like. So in each, um, each edge is contained in four squares. But then you can just combining those two pictures together, you can think about the, the whole picture. It's this kind of infinitely, infinite tessellated planes. And then also like they, it's like very highly singular structure that every edge is um, contained in, in, four, in four squares. But then how you think about prefix codes, prefix codes, it's sub, subcomplexes in this um, like two-dimensional building such that they partition 
the boundary into into disjoint um, pieces and this is already quite uh, this is slightly more difficult to see how the the boundary looks like but this is like completely de legitimate definition that you just look at some complexes which correspond to partitioning the boundary on them into disjoint pieces okay but now i think we already have you with dimension one dimension two and dimension three so now we we, we already ready to see how to get such um, already cube complexes such that their universal covers are products of three trees and more so and uh, again like all the examples i show they do belong to like infinite families so uh, this example also with my, my collaborators we have like infinite family of uh, quaternionic um, cube complexes of any dimensions and it's a bit of like non-trivial non number theory how do you get all those cube together so think why it's difficult to to get um, uh, like saying um, complexes uh, with universal covers uh, uh, like of uh, Cartesian products of saying three trees and more. Uh, so it's difficult because there are certain compatibility conditions. You they really need to all to fit together. So it's um, it's like no accident that. Um, but unless you try, right? You maybe that don't know why it's difficult. But this example, uh, actually, with this particular example, I I came up just three three years ago because. Um, you have to you have to be able to get the given links and um so but here like the first cube complex but how do you get this cube complex now now you already saw in the previous slides how to get square complexes that you get a bunch of squares and you write the words on the boundary like like you have on this picture but um then on in this example we also like put um uh, square put um those words on them on the boundary of this uh, of the squares but then also here there are three two-dimensional examples hidden but then you blend them together in such a way that they do form cubes and this is an example of 24 cubes but then you glue them together in such a way that the universal cover is a product of three trees and it's completely counterintuitive because here it's not just an edge right so the singularities in the two dimension look like one edge is containing four squares but uh, in, in the three-dimensional case even one face can can be uh, can belong to several uh, several cubes okay so maybe i will skip sister algebras because uh, and i want to see how i want to show how them how those complexes in three three dimensions look like because um actually three can be also replaced by any n so how the letters so in the three dimension even to draw a letter it's kind of difficult but we have like from from the example i showed we have 24 letters and then we glue them first we glue the edges uh, respecting orientations with the we, we glue the edges with the same labels respecting orientation but then we also glue two-dimensional faces if we see that there is the same word written on the boundary of a of a cube of a uh, of a square and then it's really kind of um, mostly theoretical how you have to how how do your prefix codes look like and actually the prefix codes it's um, set like words with certain properties but some of the properties of the words of higher dimensions turned out to be useful in in different uh, 
directions. So this is this is an example which I already um, uh, I want to, which I wanted to mention that um, it it was like almost like a by byproduct in in all this work that apparently if um, you do manage to get a complex with a universal cover which is a product of trees and um, you have this collection of cubes and what you can do you can take all the labels of them uh, of the edges each edge appears twice as itself as a letter in its inverse so for example a1 and a1 inverse it's two different letters and then if think xi xj xkzl is a label of a square then we can form an r matrix and it turns out this r matrix in the, indeed uh, uh, r matrix which appears in the theory of young baxter equations and uh, how this kind of young baxter equation can be uh, interpreted as um, like very very combinatorially by the letters and also what i would like to say right that it's not just one cube one cube it's an example so every uh, every um, polyhedron of like dimension three and higher just given give, gives them um, a solution of young baxter equation so for, for example this um, example which i which i showed for them um like for 20 24 cubes so any of those a's b's and c's you can put into an r matrix and i was checking apparently like in the in the literature and it's new solutions of young baxter equations which um uh, we don't uh, uh, we, we didn't see in the literature before so this is like um, some other connection to to the objects which appeared in theoretical physics which which i didn't expect and it's all kind of interesting to see what is uh, what how else it can be useful okay maybe maybe you ask questions because of course i wanted to talk about sister algebras as well but i don't know what um, what uh, people want to hear about and maybe somebody has some questions press press your space bar to un unmute your computer sorry to unmute press your space bar and hold it but i think my computer is unmute for a person who wants to ask questions. Ah, sorry. Where does this 153 come from? Uh, so it's um, so if you look at um, the example of um, uh, of of this group, uh, the alphabets uh, like we have um, uh, four plus and it's inverses right so we have a1 a2 a1 inverse b2 inverse so it's four plus six uh plus um eight so it's like 18 but then it's pairs right so it's like uh, uh 18 choose two because how how do we how do we get the r matrix so the r matrix we have to get for every pair of letters right so we had 18 different um, uh, labels of the cubes so then each pair is defined by a square 
So then there are like 153 pairs. So maybe I have another kind of five, five minutes. Maybe should I talk about sister algebras? How is sister algebras also involved? Yes, and also if you have any other ideas how to connect to theoretical physics or to Hamiltonians or other things like that. So maybe I talk about. Sister algebra. So again, I'm going to come back to the dimension one. And um, so it's, um, I don't know how to call it. Maybe it's like graph algebras, but what I would say that it's, it's some kind of, uh, uh, it's related to, to the Jones Pythagorean algebras, but um, it's slightly different. Um, um, uh, what what I think that those algebras which I'm talking about they are maybe quotients of the uh, of the Jones Pythagorean algebras. So, uh, but this is the way how uh, I generalize it for for the higher dimensions because so uh, I want to introduce some geometry because indeed like this kind of higher dimensional generalizations of anything. Uh, requires some extra structure to be able to, that we are able to analyze this. So now let's come back to the picture of the Kelly graph of a free group on two generators, which I had in the beginning of the talk. And again, we look at the kind of uh, reduced words uh, in, in the free group. But then also how we think about the boundary, right? We think about the boundary of the trees, like the set of all semi-infinite words and then like the boundary has a, a natural totally disconnected topology so think if you have an element of of the free group then uh, the boundary is um, like all uh, the sigma of x is the all semi-infinite words with the prefix x and so we somehow can define are the basis of them of the topology so we can treat the boundary of them uh, of the tree as a topological space and then um, what we do we we do have the group uh, gamma acting acting on them on the boundary and we can define a semi-direct product of the group with the continuous functions uh, defined on the boundary of of the tree so it's a way to this kind of sister algebra which is a which is a, a semi-direct product of the functions uh, on the boundary with um, um, with the group and um, of course maybe it's like too too many details but just to to give the idea that um, we can look at the uh, like projection defined by the characteristic functions and then we can get um, the following relation for the group that it's like the sum of the uh, projections equal to one and then we can get um, we can define our algebra in terms of like partial partial isometry on the on the boundary and we do have this uh, kind of relax relations uh, of this uh, kind like um, um, s x star s x and this really reminds this kind of uh, either Kuntz algebras and uh, Johnson Pythagorean algebras it's all this kind of um, uh, sister algebras which which appear in the literature and also they have many different names and also it's not they always like isomorphic always there is some kind of they, they are related but they have some kind of um, differences um, sometimes and actually what is the best way to distinguish 
algebra so of such kind it's um, to find their case theory and what is nice that if you have some geometry behind then uh, there are explicit methods to compute the case theory and um, i would like just to give a flavor how to define uh, similar algebras for the higher for the higher dimensions also like um, to to describe this algebras you can you can think about transition matrices and this there is some kind of relation to uh, uh, dynamical systems but I want to like give this uh, generalization what what I think about like uh, just to give a flavor what I think about like so-called poly polyhedral system algebras so instead of trees we do consider buildings and again the, we consider the boundary of the building and then instead of the free group we look at them fundamental group of one of the complexes I'll, I described. So all these examples, like with triangles, with squares, with cubes, there is a fundamental group of this, um, um, of this complex. There is a universal cover, which is a building. So there is a boundary of the building, which is well-defined. And then we can um, define a cross product algebra, how we did it for them. Uh, for the free group as well, so we can look at the um, direct pro as the semi-direct product uh, of the group with the uh, with the continuous functions on the boundary. And maybe I finish with the formal definition of the sister algebra. And uh, so there are like um, complicated relations. But those relations are defined by the geometry of those like cubes and complexes. And since uh, this is quite a general definition, so that's why like the, the relations are also quite, uh, uh, quite messy. But the idea is that uh, every polyhedra which, uh, which I constructed gives us some kind of higher dimensional alphabet and then how the letters of those of the higher dimensional alphabet how they can be like um, uh, how you can put them next to each other uh, it, it defines uh, the relations of of your algebra but then i already mentioned it's really kind of byproduct that uh, the words in the higher dimension alphabet also satisfy some compatibility conditions, which are quite technical, but I already showed an example that actually they give new solutions of Jan Baxter equations. Okay. Yeah, so maybe I just also, ah, so what, what I also didn't say that, um, I didn't mention that in certain cases, we can compute the case theory of these sister algebras, like really in a very, very explicit way, like really to give them concrete uh, uh, computations like concrete groups. And if we do this for them, uh, so every Thomson group construction gives us also sister algebra construction. And if those sister algebras turn out to be uh, different, then the Thomson groups are not isomorphic either. And uh, so it's like if we compute the and um, for them, um, sister algebras coming from this kind of polyhedra, we, we do have explicit methods of computing k theory so yeah so in this way you can get higher dimensional thompson groups which which are non-isomorphic and what i would like to say that also for them uh, like uh, other types of uh, thompson groups and there are also Sta um, melanie stein groups so there were there were some known examples of groups of not being isomorphic but in this way of computing by computing k theory you can also distinguish some no known examples, not only uh, the new ones. And uh, this is more maybe what uh, I just mentioned a lot of um, uh, to topics, what, what one can do you know, with um, all, all these objects, but also one, one of the ways I would like to highlight that I also think um, I just started to, to work on this, 
but I think that one can also get a unit representation of higher dimensional Thomson groups in a similar way like von Jones uh, uh, got it for, for them, for his Pythagorean algebras and uh, even I asked him by email, so he said that it's very likely that maybe it's similar message would uh, work in higher dimensions as well, but it's still like work in progress. Okay, thank you very much for your, for your attention. Und ist das Video auch? Ja. So there should be lots of questions. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, what what do you know about uh, the uh, uh, sub factors of the C star algebras you, you constructed? Ah, actually, it's also work in progress. It's very very interesting to know, but it's not completely straightforward. I just started to look at it because, yeah. So thank you very much. Very, I would be very happy to discuss this. The question is where exactly to to start with which examples because it's. Uh, because the so I, I can say what um, uh, what what I'm doing now. So the, um, with the with this kind of very general form, is quite difficult to work. So I started kind of simplifying certain examples. So actually, I have now like um, two example which um, consist like of. Uh, two sets of equations which, which are similar to, to the jones Pythagorean algebras. And um, maybe there one can get something, but I, for, for the moment, I don't know. It's, I, I know about this question, it's very interesting, but I didn't get it yet. But I would be very, very happy to discuss more details, yeah, like by email or by Zoom. And... Yeah, thank you. So just here yeah. it's, um, every every bit in the in the dimension one like when you go to the higher dimensions it's a lot of more work because for example i already this idea how to generalize thompson groups um, like uh, i already had this idea like sev several years ago but to write everything formally so i'm very happy like have my collaborator mark lawson who is algebraist and uh, Actually, our paper, which is just accepted, which is just uh, published in advance, is actually it's written in a algeb very algebraic way. The, the, there is a connection with sister algebras, but it's written in an algebraic way, and it's like 55 pages to make everything formal. So even all this about sister algebras, even about the sister algebras, it's not completely formalized and written up. It's, of course, it's all true, but every time it's it's really a long way to put everything um, formally so now even i'm quite happy that already like the this higher dimensional thompson group and their relation with sister algebra is already published and yeah it's it's very, that's why i said it's quite quite a big field so i i would be happy like to have more collaborators and discussions and also to have an input with what are the questions which are interested so like i already talked talk to arthur and to chingwe and they told me this connection with them um, that actually, I, I first I saw that it's just something which looks like Jan Baxter equation, but then it turns out that it uh, gives like um, unitary representations of actually braid groups. It's yeah, very good question. Thank you very much. Can you present your? Uh... Thompson groups as normalizers of a maximal abelian subalgebra of the relevant sister algebra. I don't know. So there is an occurrence for the classical Thompson group to be in terms of O2, precisely in this form. Ah. Very interesting. So, what what you what you mean exactly? How it's um, how it's done? 
So if you take the Kuntz algebra O2, you take the diagonal, the canonical. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So then I understand, I understand what you mean, yeah. So I think it's possible that um, uh, how, how it can be done. Yeah, you are absolutely right. You can, you can do this. But how I think about it, the, because what, what you just, just mentioned, how I think about it, uh, I think about it also in terms of prefix codes, how I get, um, uh, how I embed the Thomson group. It's like by, uh, I think about like finite, finite trees. And then also how I think about the sister algebras, like how I think about O2. I think about O2 as a uh, rooted tree, rooted infinite tree, and also how it fits to, to what I was talking about now. I think also about the boundary as like semi-infinite words and so on, so as a cross product algebra. And then it really with this setting, the Thomson group fits, uh, uh, is, uh, can be embedded into, into the uh, O2. It's like Thomson group here with two generators. And actually it works exactly the same. And also thank you very much. It's a, very good question uh, that um, uh, this is the way how you distinguish uh, the, um, uh, those high dimensional Thomson groups because then you compute uh, the K theory of, of the relevant sister algebras. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Thank you very much. Because when you said O2, it's like you meant Kutz algebra, right? With two generators, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so very good that you, uh, yeah, I saw that it's like very technical, but you, you indeed picked uh, the essence that it's indeed goes um, uh, through all the dimensions, but of course it's like much, much harder to show because it's like there is a lot of generality. Are there any other questions? We have a lot of people with different backgrounds here. I'm sure that people must have more questions. <laughs> no, but I'm always very happy to answer emails and it's, uh, I wanted to give just a flavor. I wanted to talk about many things in the same time. And yeah, it's of course difficult. But we already had very good questions. Yes. So then uh, before we thank you again, I'd like to just remark that on our YouTube channel, your talk will appear along with your slides. And we have the seven of the previous talks already there and anybody can enjoy them if they want. So let's thank Alina for a very interesting talk with many open things. and. I'll look to the work in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.